International Infection Prevention Week. Today's webinar, Preventing the Next Avoidable Catastrophe in Low and Middle Resource Countries, is hosted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in collaboration with APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. My name is Abigail Tumpy. I'm Associate Director for Communication Science for CDC's Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion. CDC's mission is to protect patients wherever they receive their medical care. This webinar is part of a series of infection control related webinars that CDC is hosting with a variety of external partners and experts. The featured speaker on our webinar today is Dr. Benjamin Park, Chief of the International Infection Control Program at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion. Dr. Park will discuss healthcare outbreaks from a global perspective. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items to cover. First of all, we welcome your questions. Please submit any questions or comments you have via the chat window located at the lower left-hand side of your webinar screen. You may enter these questions at any time. Questions will be addressed after all presentations as time allows. To ask for help, please press the raise hand button located at the top left-hand side of your screen if you need to chat with a meeting chairperson for assistance due to technical difficulties during the webinar. As a reminder, to hear the audio, please ensure that the speakers on your computer are turned with the volume up. Today's conference should be coming through your computer or laptop speakers. Additionally, the slides from today's presentation will be emailed to all participants following today's discussion. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Linda Green, President-Elect of APIC, who will provide introductory remarks on behalf of the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Linda? Linda? You can take it from here. Just make sure your phone is, on, is off mute. So hopefully we'll come back to Linda later in the presentation. It looks like we're having some te technical difficulties hearing her. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ben Park, who is going to um, take the conversation from here. Dr. Park? Thanks, Abigail. Um, it's really great to be on this webinar. Um, thank you for the invitation, and thank you to APIC. Um, and to also to our folks here at CDC for hosting the event. Uh, I'm really excited to be talking to you all. Um, you know, we got word that there were, you know, um, a few thousand people that registered, so I hope that this will go out to a lot of people. Um, so my name is Ben Park. I'm the chief of the International Infection Control Program here at the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion. And I'd like to talk to you about um, some of my experiences and some of the uh, priorities for CDC and for the U.S. government moving forward based on these experiences. And I think, you know, this, having International Infection Prevention Week is great, and it's great to have so many people around the world in the U.S. and in other countries focused on infection prevention because it's such a critical topic. And for this talk, for this talk today, I think, you know, what I'd like to do is to highlight some experiences that hopefully will kind of crystallize how important infection prevention is for you all and how the work that you do uh, in your facilities, whether it's in the United States or it's in other countries, how critical it is for public health. Um, and I think it's a, it's a story that we're, we're, we're sort of uh, used to hearing about now, but it's always good to see how the, what the bigger perspective is. And then I'd also like to talk about how we can use these experiences and some of these lessons learned towards the future and how we can um, build uh, structures and systems so that we might be able to prevent the next catastrophe. And, um, you know, I think hopefully um, we won't be seeing the next avoidable catastrophe, but again, that's what the whole purpose of this, this talk is about. So I'm going to take us, so if we could all think about, you know, a lot of us are kind of right now in, a, in, in your office or, or at home looking at the computer, but just kind of imagine that you're getting on a plane with me and we're going to go 
across the world to some places that are a little bit different from the facilities that you typically will see, um, the ones that you work in. Um, and these are, t a lot of times, these are the facilities that you'll see in uh, low and middle income countries, low and middle resource countries. And I don't want to, I don't want to make it seem like this is, you know, everything, like that, that this is, you know, the, what, what we always see in these countries. Because of, because of course, as many of us know, there are many outstanding stellar facilities in, in countries that have um, um, high rates of, of poverty and, and lower incomes. But I think one of the most crucial aspects to focus on are those weak links in the, in the healthcare system, which are typically some of the w lower resource environments. So I think, well, I'll start, well, the story that I'll start off with um, goes all the way back to um, SARS in 2003. I started CDC in 2002, and SARS, I remember very distinctly SARS being one of the things that kind of crystallized my um, interest in public health. I was, um, again, I was only here at CDC for one year, but one of the things that I think, for those of you that remember the SARS epidemic, remember is that one of the key characteristics was the, um, the amount and number of infections that occurred within healthcare facilities. There were these things called super spreaders um, that, that occurred in, in Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and also in Canada. Um, there were lots of these events that, that led to a number of healthcare workers becoming ill. And this is one of the key aspects of the epidemiology of this outbreak. Not only was it being transmitted in the community from person to person, but um, importantly, it was being trans transmitted in healthcare facilities. And I think you know you don't have to you don't have to be in a low resource setting with with you know poor infection control to understand that this happened in many high resource settings like in Toronto um, and also in areas like Singapore. Then fast forward to just two years ago, um, in uh, I think we all remember the Ebola outbreak, and of course I'm going to be talking a lot about Ebola today. But um, two years ago. In the summer, um, a little bit more than two years ago, in the summer of 2014, um, Ebola had emerged in Guinea, and it had spread to the court, to the neighboring countries, uh, primarily Liberia and Sierra Leone. And you know, it was kind of largely thought of as being handled in the summer. Although there were some, as the summer progressed, there were some signs that it was maybe kind of spiraling out of control. And I think what really galvanized the uh, international community was when um, a gentleman named Patrick Sawyer flew from Monrovia to Lagos, which is the most populous city in, uh, in Africa, um, and came and traveled on the plane and was admitted to a hospital with Ebola. And this, I think, scared a lot of people because I think this people realized that if it gets out of control in Lagos, um, again, the, one of the most densely populated cities in Africa and then the most populous, and also a hub for commerce and travel. If it gets out in uh, Lagos, who knows what's going to happen? It could certainly impact, you know, Western Africa, the whole of Africa, maybe even other areas outside the world. Um, and so uh, I actually went to Nigeria as one of the first people to go to help try to uh, set up infection control. And one of the things that I found when I got there was that I think some of the things that we take for granted in, in, around infection control and infection prevention, some of those systems just weren't in place in Nigeria. And so, again, we were trying to make sure that the outbreak didn't spiral out of control. And one of the things that we were doing was helping to provide training to healthcare workers around what to do if they were to see someone that were to come in. Thankfully, I think we all know the end of the story is that Nigeria ended up being able to control the outbreak, um, thankfully, with a lot of hard work from public health and from clinicians. Um, and we didn't experience this. But certainly the fear was there, and certainly the fear about what could happen um, was a large part of the motivation for such a large public health response. But it didn't even stop there. I think Ebola is something that's all fresh in our minds, but you know, there is also something called MERS that we all might have heard about. Uh, certainly um, in the Middle East, it's, it's something that is um, a regional issue there, but you know what we found after Ebola even was that these um, emerging diseases continue. Um, in in Seoul in 2015, um, a traveler from the Middle East went to Seoul and had a respiratory illness and, and ended up causing a number of infections throughout 
the city um, in many different hospitals. And there are a lot of reasons why these kind of mul this multifocal kind of outbreak happened, but one of the key components was really um, infection control precautions that weren't uh, adhered to and, um, and where infection control, um, especially in uh, emergency departments, was, um, was, was lacking. And so, you know, it's interesting. So I, um, you know, I'm Korean-American, and my parents actually live in Seoul. And it was, it's funny because um, this is probably the first time, I think, in recent memory that my parents like, fully understood what it is that I do on a day-to-day -day basis because, it, because they saw uh, how important MERS was and how, how it impacted their economy. Actually, in South Korea, you know, I think the, um, you know, actually the, the stock market went down. I think that, you know, uh, millions of dollars were lost because of the outbreak, because of people were um, isolating themselves in, in their communities, in their homes, and were not traveling, as well as the healthcare system, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, um, largely shut down for a period of weeks. The story doesn't end at MERS. It continues, and, it, and, um, it ta and I think the next threat that we're all talking about right now is um, antimicrobial resistance, things like carbapenem resistant and or bacteria um, where the burden of these infections, especially in low- and middle-income countries like India and like Southeast Asia and also parts of Africa, are pro is probably quite high. And probably the mortality, morbidity from these infections, um, for a number of reasons, um, is quite high. And um, this is also the next, this, you know, this could be the next epidemic. And, of course, we all heard, remember the... Um, we all remember what happened with the colistin resistant superbug of MCR1, which was just reported recently. And, you know, is this kind of the next wave of antimicrobial resistance? And how does this relate to infection control? So all these things are going to be talking about as the, as the talk goes on. Well, you know, I think it's when we think about these problems and we think about these outbreaks, you know, a lot of these things are happening in low middle income countries. and um, I think, you know, it's, sometimes it's easy for us in our facilities to think that we're, you know, relatively insulated, relatively safe from some of these things. But, of course, we just have to point to things like what happened in Nigeria with the one plane ride from Patrick Sawyer from Monrovia to, to um, Lagos. Or, you know, thinking about, obviously, what happened um, with other emerging diseases, about how, you know, these infections are really just a plane ride away. And these could pop up in our emergency department. They could pop up on our wards in the United States. Um, and then it's something that we're going to have to deal with. And granted, we have better, uh, uh, to generalize, better infection control in the United States. But still, are we prepared to handle these, um, types, of, um, to t these types of emerging infectious diseases? And so this, this picture actually is, a, is one that I'd love to show because it's really interesting. What it shows, all these yellow lines our um, are, are air travel, and these are the, the, the primary routes of air travel, and the darker the line, obviously, the more, um, the more, uh, con the more uh, traveled it is. But you can just see how interconnected the world is um, through this. All right, so let's talk a little bit about outbreaks. I think that one of the things that um, is great around infection control and infection prevention is, is that you deal with outbreaks on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you deal with outbreaks in your facilities. But this is, actually isn't the case in, uh, in a lot of low-resource settings. Um, you know, a lot of the countries that I've been to, a lot of the um, hospitals I've been to, talking to people in the hospitals, the first thing that you'll notice is that typically there aren't infection, pre infection preventionists. Certainly there, there may be a nurse that's whose job it is <clears throat> Is to do infection control, but they're not—they don't have the level of training of a infection of an IP in, in the United States. Um, and a lot of times, they are not also focused on on outbreaks. So, what happens in an outbreak? To, you know, the just generally speaking, you know, um, in most outbreaks, clinicians will recognize and report an outbreak, um, and public health would typically be the group that is involved in the response and control. This is oftentimes the case, especially with community-acquired diseases, where you know a clinician will will identify a case of, of a rare disease or of, of something and will notify public health, and the public health will look across 
you know, other facilities and look and to see that there are um, cases or not cases, and we'll conduct an investigation, try to find the source, and identify the outbreak. But in healthcare-associated infections, it's a, it's a little bit different because because uh, healthcare-associated infections occur in clinical facilities, clinicians have a, have a very powerful role and an integral role to play in the outbreak investigation. Clinicians and public health oftentimes will work together um, with, these, with, with these outbreaks. And a lot of times that works really well. I think, you know, I think we can all think about outbreaks that have happened in our facilities and how we've worked with public health potentially either at the state level or at the federal level to be able to control an outbreak. Um, but this isn't actually the same system that, we, that they have in a lot of low- and middle-income countries. As I mentioned, the infection prevention or infection control nurses sometimes, um, first of all, sometimes they're not there, but then even if they are there, they're not trained on, on outbreaks. They're not trained on outbreak detection or control, and they certainly are, are not trained on how to link up with public health. So this is one area where um, there's going to be um, some of the key um, resources in the future are going to be pointed towards how can we strengthen this linkage between the clinical facility and public health, especially in low- and middle-income countries. Well, let's talk more about outbreaks, and I want to talk specifically about why healthcare facilities are so important. Um, I think that we talked about how they play a special role in, the, in that the people are involved um, and can be closely linked to public health. But what is it special about the healthcare facility, and why is that so important for outbreak control? Well, from a public health perspective, healthcare facilities are unique places because I think we know sick people go to healthcare facilities, and and when these sick people have particularly transmissible diseases, um, then they become the healthcare facilities become a focal point for the, for the epidemiology of an outbreak. And this gets also back not only to the fact that patients, sick patients, go to healthcare facilities, and then that obviously becomes a key place where they are. But healthcare facilities also are important for the control of infectious diseases because if you think about what are the key principles for the control of transmissible diseases, there's, you know, the key things that public health professionals like to point to, there's isolation, vaccination, and prophylaxis. And these are the things that public health professionals will typically point to in any outbreak. So if it's an outbreak of influenza or, or cholera or something like that, these are key um, tools in the armamentarium to prevent diseases. And of course, Isolation is something that happens um, at healthcare facilities as well as in the community, of course. But um, for healthcare facilities, this is a key principle. So, in healthcare facilities, there is a need to be able to um, isolate patients effectively. And if this need, to, if this key capacity does not exist, then the healthcare facility can turn into a place where disease can be transmitted. And then you've got this kind of perfect storm. You've got patients who come sick to a hospital and there's no isolation capacity, and furthermore, there's no even ability to identify the patients, and then healthcare, trans and then healthcare associated transmission of transmissible diseases can occur. And the, you just have to think about uh, the, this perfect storm when you think about low and middle income countries, because what, when you go to healthcare facilities in these countries, healthcare facilities typically are under-resourced, you know, clinicians are overworked, and what that means is that you have things like this waiting room where um, they're very crowded, there are a lot of people there, and they're kind of, you know, key setups for disease transmission. This is what we saw a lot with a lot of these outbreaks that I talked about earlier on that I was highlighting is that emergency departments as well as other areas in the wards um, are just areas where disease can, can, can easily be transmitted from one person to another. And I think for a lot of us that are familiar with um, – with, with infection control, we just had a look at one of these types of settings and we can see clearly that um, if, there, if one of the patients in this waiting room had MERS or had the next, or had Ebola or had the next highly contagious um, disease, that this would be a very efficient way for that disease to spread. And I don't want to single out emergency departments as a, as, as a key problem area because there are m many throughout healthcare facilities um, uh, on the wards, and I'm going to talk about, when we talk about Ebola, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. All right, well, let's talk about Ebola. Let's talk about what happened. And I think one of the key narratives that came out of the Ebola epidemic was um, that the healthcare system collapsed. And, you know, I think 
for those of us that were following this closely, you know, there was initially there was disease transmission, and then it got worse, and then what we heard was that the healthcare system was collapsing, and you know, but I think it's it's worthwhile to examine that further, because what does it really mean when the healthcare system collapses? Um, you know, and I, I think we should we should talk about that. Now, with Ebola, the if care for Ebola patients happened in two different areas. There was the general healthcare facilities, like a general hospital, and then there were the what we call the ETUs, the Ebola treatment units, where um, these were the these are the areas where patients with Ebola were treated, and um, these ETUs were generally staffed by. Um, uh, non-governmental organizations like Doctors Without Borders, like uh, WHO, um, like you know the, um, uh, um, other other um, uh, governmental organizations that had pretty well, pretty good stocks of PPE and had the layout of the ETUs already designed because they were essentially constructed. And many of you may have seen pictures of this, and where there was you know a big field and there were these kind of big tent set up with, you know, this white sheeting um, and people kind of beyond the fence had, um, you know, full, you know, uh, Tyvek on. And that is um, primarily the uh, where patients with Ebola were treated. And those actually were not where the dangerous um, settings were. If you actually look at the epidemiology of Ebola and the, and the healthcare associated cases, by and large, uh, people, um, the healthcare workers in these ETUs were safe, and patients did not typically transmit Ebola from one patient to another, and healthcare workers were generally pretty safe because they had good PPE, they were well trained, um, and there was good environmental cleaning. The dangerous areas really were the general healthcare facilities. These are the places where people, um, because they didn't know if they were a contact or not, because there was such general transmission, people came to the healthcare facilities with a fever, and they had no idea if they, that they had Ebola, they could have had malaria. but because there wasn't this good recognition at the healthcare facilities, um, the healthcare facilities, um, the general healthcare facilities, is where Ebola became became transmitted. And so what happened was that Ebola actually turned out to be a story about IPC in general healthcare facilities. Um, in the general healthcare facilities, IPC was not being practiced well enough. And what happened was that disease transmitted from patient to patient, from doc from patient to doctor, from doctor to patient and doctor to doctor, um, and, and when I say doctor, I mean healthcare professional, because it wasn't just doctors, of course, there were nurses, there were cleaners, and many other people that were impacted. Um, and then this led actually to an amplification of the, of the outbreak instead of control. So um, when, these, when, when healthcare pr providers left these facilities, went to their community, um, they could transmit it to their community, and this actually led to, again, as I said, an amplification, whereas healthcare facilities should be, um, as I talked about, should be an area where they can control the disease with through good isolation, good recognition. Um, without that, it turned into actually um, an amplification. And so, as a result, you know these healthcare facilities were quite dangerous places. Um, you know, um, early, in, especially at the height of the outbreak, and this is a picture taken from a hospital in Liberia. Um, um, in the height of the outbreak, these are literally places where there were there were there's a lot. There were extremely dangerous places where. Um, it was uh, it was unsafe to go into these into these facilities, and um, as you can imagine, these are would be areas where, um, if we could recognize the danger, clearly patients understood, and doctors understood, and, and nurses understood, and cleaners understood that these were dangerous areas, and as a result, um, patients stopped going to healthcare facilities. Um, a lot of physicians, a lot of nurses, a lot of cleaners, a lot of staff refused to come to work because there was no, there was little, there were little PPE, there was little training around how to protect themselves. And, you know, they were um, extremely dedicated individuals, but at the same time, you know, they understood that, you know, they, they were highly risky areas. And so what happened was that patients, as I mentioned, stopped going to healthcare facilities. Staff stopped coming, stopped coming to work. And this impact was felt across the healthcare system. So um, core essential services like immunizations and like deliveries at healthcare facilities declined rapidly. These are two um, figures taken from um, an, an evaluation of the impact of the Ebola outbreak on health systems in Sierra Leone. And the, um, the, the table on the left shows the hospital admissions and consultations during the outbreak, kind of pre and post, showing that 
maternity admissions and pediatric admissions, and basically all admissions dropped precipitously during the height of the outbreak. And the graph on the right shows the number of children that were vaccinated in, in this one area called Coinadugo in Sierra Leone, showing the tremendous drop-off in vaccination. So what this means is essentially that, you know, core public health functions like delivering babies in a hospital, like vaccinating children, you know, these were things that, that fell by the wayside because people stopped accessing health care. So fundamentally, all of this was a ripple effect from poor infection control. So when we talk about the health care system collapsing, what we're really talking about was that IPC collapse, the infection control collapse, leading to a further um, deterioration of the health care system and of public health in general. So I think this is a story you know, when, when now when people think about Ebola, when people talk about how the healthcare system collapsed and how the healthcare system needs strengthening, I think it's important for us to point out, well, what do you mean the healthcare system needs strengthening? What needs strengthening? And I, infection control should be a key area of that conversation. But as I mentioned earlier in the talk, you, you know, this is not something that should be thought of as isolated in low in the kind of poorest countries in, in West Africa. I think that was certainly a key determinant. Certainly it was something that helped um, the outbreak spiral out of control. But we see this all the time. We see, of course, uh, uh, for those of you that work in healthcare facilities, you see outbreaks that happen all the time in your healthcare facilities. And as I pointed out with MERS, um, this can happen in strong healthcare systems too. Of course, SARS in Toronto, um, in Singapore, you know, of course, issues around CRE, and, um, and, and, and um, other transmissible diseases, these can happen in our healthcare facilities. And it's not, I, I, don't think that, I don't think it would be wise to think that, okay, my healthcare system has enough PPE and my healthcare system has enough um, training. Um, it can't happen here. It can happen in any healthcare facility, but, but of course, those without training and those without the key, um, key, key material um, are at higher risk. So this brings us to the issue around preparedness, and it brings us to the issue around what is the world doing to help to prepare to respond. Well, after the SARS epidemic in 2003, there was something that the world came together and um, developed something called the International Health Regulations. And the International Health Regulations were designed um, in 2005, and all 194 countries of the world signed on to this, I think it's a treaty, through WHO, to essentially um, provide the core components around um, preparedness to prevent the next kind of catastrophic thing from happening. And these were, uh, these are, the international health regulations are a, co a core set of, um, of functions that health healthcare systems and governments should do in order to prepare themselves for the next outbreak. And there was an assessment in 2014 that showed that only 30% of countries were fully prepared to detect and respond to an outbreak. Showing essentially that, you know, in the you know eleven in the eleven years since SARS and the nine years since IHR was was implemented, there's still a large gap in 2014. Of course, we saw what happened in 2014 with the Ebola outbreak. So, overall, the world generally needs more work in this in this in this preparedness. And when you talk about preparedness, of course, one of the key components, as I mentioned, around preparedness is around healthcare, faci healthcare facility and IPC, and, I and IPC is one key component around international health regulations. Of course, in international health regulations, there are other things besides IPC, but that is one key component in what we're talking about today. So there was a study um, in, during the height of the Ebola outbreak trying to look at to see, to see if hospitals were prepared um, around the world for Ebola virus disease. And this slide focuses on Africa because, of, because I think it's, it's important to see that you know, Africa was clearly one of the areas where, um, that we're focusing on in terms of low and middle resource areas. And it's also the area, the continent, that was probably the most at risk for developing transmission of Ebola. But even in, in Africa, at the height of the outbreak, you know, um, only about, um, only a third of, um, of um, so a third of the respondents from this survey were from Africa. But um, of these people, you know, preparedness for Ebola was really only partially adequate. And the authors of this study looked at especially about isolation capacity and found that across the world, only, you know, less than 70 percent had, had sufficient isolation capacity. And in Africa, it was many fewer hospitals. They didn't give the exact proportion here. But I think suffice to say that preparedness 
and isolation facilities in Africa, even at the height of the Ebola outbreak, when everyone was supposed to be preparing and preparing their facilities, um, many fewer than 69% in Africa were prepared. Well, I think easier said than done, right? I think a lot of us can, can, can say that these things have to happen and these things are so important, but um, it's, it's difficult to actually get these things done. And it's difficult, um, it's difficult to have infection control at your facility. It's, it's furthermore, it's even more difficult to be able to have infection control staff and, um, and resources to be able to effectively uh, investigate and respond to threats like outbreaks. One of the key areas um, that, um, one of the key weaknesses, I think, in a lot of low-resource countries, granted, I'm generalizing here, but in many low- and middle-income countries, um, the linkage between the clinical facility and the public health authority is weak. Um, and uh, I mentioned how important this was for outbreaks earlier in the talk. And, um, and when this linkage is weak, then what happens is that public health has very little visibility into what's going on in healthcare facilities. Um, and then when healthcare associated clusters or, or transmission happens, the public health authority has a kind of a blind eye. And so um, this is one of the key areas that need to be strengthened um, around preparedness and response for outbreaks. In addition, it's something that I haven't talked about so far, but it's a reality in um, low and middle income countries is the lack of a dependable laboratory. And laboratories in low- and middle-income countries um, have had great investment in things um, related to um, HIV, related to um, tuberculosis, um, related to malaria. But I think what's fallen by the wayside a little bit is key laboratory infrastructure around microbiology. And I think microbiology, we all depend on our, on our microbiology labs to tell us about not only what the organism is, but also what the susceptibility is, and whether, and then we look at that, we look at those organisms and those profiles and things like that to be able to see if, if there is a cluster of disease, um, and um, microbiology and and and, for, and and other things like serology have have are not um, as strong as they as they could be, and um, probably deserve some strengthening. In addition, another um, obstacle for this um, preparedness and outbreak investigation is um, just a lack of training on outbreak investigations in healthcare facilities. So there is an effort underway, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, around strengthening outbreak investigations in low- and middle-income countries. But typically, the healthcare facility is not um, a focus, and it's something that we are trying to um, strengthen um, moving forward. All right, so now that we've talked about some of the gaps, hopefully I haven't depressed all of you. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit about what, well, what are some of the solutions? How do we actually bridge some of these gaps, and how can we address some of these key issues um, in low- and middle-income countries? Because I think it's something that even that a lot of us ha are um, actually are, have a vested interest in. I mean, I think in order to keep kind of some of these emerging diseases out of our facilities, it's important to be able to address them at the facilities where they occur. Um, and, and sometimes that's in low- and middle-income countries, of course. I don't want to make it seem like I'm singling out these, these areas because, as we all know, sometimes it goes the other way where we have diseases that emerge and it's, it's transported to these countries as well. Well, one of the things that we're trying to focus on is how do we make IPC a priority? Um, as, I may, as you can imagine, it hasn't been a priority in many countries. Again, I'm generalizing because I think there are some shining examples of that. Um, but in general, IPC needs to be prioritized. And I think one of the key things to think about um, for those of us that do work in low and middle income countries is how important IPC is and how important it is to many different stakeholders. Um, it's not just important to us as infection preventionists or as physicians or as clinicians, um, but it's important to a whole a wide array of stakeholders, including hospitals and hospital administrators. Um, they have a key, um, key, key role to play um, also, civil societies and and, um, and 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 patient advocacy groups, um, also professional societies um, like infectious disease clinicians or um, nurses societies. Um, these are key stakeholders that should be engaged um, when we're thinking about how to strengthen and build the case for improving infection control. Certainly, academic groups are a key player um, in universities, but also donors uh, thinking about 
you know, I think this is an area where there hasn't been a lot of donor investment um, from some of the key um, donors in global health. And how can we make a case that it's important for donors to think about infection control as it relates to health security overall? Well, what do we do once we've developed these, once we've developed our, um, our stakeholder group and once we have this kind of momentum behind us? Well, actually, there, there have been documents talking about and uh, d discussing how to implement infection control programs within countries. And this is um, all based on a 2009 document called the WHO Co Core Components um, for Infection Prevention and Control Programs. It's actually something that's being updated right now, and the new one's going to be coming out um, sometime later this year or maybe early next year, but most of it will stay the same. And what this document talks about is how countries um, can prioritize and can, can look at the different components around what is needed for an infection control program. And this is broken down into the national level and at the facility level. So um, it's really kind of a roadmap around um, what to do for infection control. Um, and, it and it touches on basic things like the, how do we organize an IPC program at a facility or at a national level? How, you know, what's the importance of technical guidelines and how do we have national guidelines but also facility-based guidelines? Prioritizing human resources, doing surveillance, the importance of the micro lab, as Jeff already mentioned, the importance of the environment and cleaning and hygiene um, and water and, and sanitation. Um, um, how, how do we monitor and evaluate these programs? And very importantly, as I've mentioned a number of times already, how do we link with public health and how do we link with a public health authority to do things like prepare and, and respond to outbreaks? So this brings me to a, um, an initiative by the U.S. government um, as well as uh, other governments around the world, um, which was born out of the Ebola crisis. I think um, I've painted a picture that shows that um, there needs to be a lot of investment within um, low and middle income countries around preparedness for outbreaks. One, of that, one, of, one key component of that is IPC. But there are other key components, including building up laboratories, building up surveillance infrastructure, um, you know, building up um, uh, laboratory referral networks, building up information systems that can help respond to outbreaks. These are all kind of key components that were identified in the Ebola outbreak. And one of the things that has happened out of this is something called the Global Health Security Agenda, which um, is an initiative not just of the United States government, but also of many other governments that have signed on, talking about how do we identify the key priorities around, um, around, around what, what it constitutes global health security and how can we strengthen those things to prevent the next avoidable catastrophe. And what the Global Health Security Agenda is, it was launched in February 2014 to advance uh, a, a world safe and secure for infectious disease threats. And this is something that um, the G7 in endorsed. Um, it's something that um, initially Finland and Indonesia were the kind of leaders of this um, initiative. But a lot of countries throughout the world have signed on to this, um, have signed on to being um, a part of the Global Health Security Agenda, basically committing that they were going to not only not only um, follow the global health security agenda goals for their own country, but we're also going to try to help other countries meet those goals for global health security. And all of these global health security agenda activities fit into the international health regulations. They're all, um, they all work, are, are designed to work with IHR to be able to strengthen the IHR goals so that, again, we can all prepare for the next um, uh, the next uh, pandemic or the next epidemic. So, with global health security, there are three major risks that we're that, they're try that we're trying to address, and those are emerging organisms, drug resistance, and the intentional creation of, of, of a biohazard. Three opportunities, including societal commitment, new technologies, and success, leading to more success. And then the three major priorities organized around prevention, detection, and response to infectious disease threats. So these are organized around what we call action packages. And these action packages are things um, that we are targeting um, for investment, for capacity building. And um, these vary in terms of, uh, as I mentioned before, things like building surveillance capacity, things like building reporting systems, laboratory systems, um, strengthening workforces, building what we call emergency operation centers that are kind of the hub for outbreak detection and response. Um, also, um, how do we 
uh, you know, deploy medical countermeasures and link public health with law enforcement. But then we also have these four <clears throat> subject matter areas around antimicrobial resistance, zoonotic diseases, biosafety and biosecurity and immunization. And where I, infection control fits in is around antimicrobial resistance, um, where antimicrobial resistance is seen as a key area, again, to, to kind of address the emerging threat of AR uh, and, and, and how strengthening AR can, can lead to strengthening, to reducing, to reducing AR, but also strengthening overall the, the infection control networks um, that we have in country. So talking a little bit more about this action package of AR, um, again, this is around the prevention um, uh, aspect, preventing uh, the, the, the further emergence and preventing um, more AR, where um, there are a number of countries that have already signed on to really try to lead this um, multinational effort. And um, actually, the leading countries are, are currently Canada, Germany, the Netherlands, and Sweden, and there are a number of other contributing countries. And what it means to be a leading or contributing country really means that um, the, you know, the, to provide some of the technical assistance and knowledge around um, not, only not only having your, our own countries who have signed on meeting the goals of, of this action package target, but also helping other countries um, achieve um, these goals as well. So what are we trying to do around this action package? What we're trying to do is we're trying to implement an integrated and global package of activities to, to combat AR, um, where each country has its own plan, um, surveillance and laboratory capacity strengthened, both at the national and international level, and that we're conserving the existing treatments um, and supporting the development of new antibiotics, as well as um, providing new diagnostics and things like infection control to combat AR. Um, countries are actively working on plans right now, actively working on their, um, their, their uh, AR action plans, and this all fits in with what's called the WHO Global Action Plan for Antimicrobial Resistance. Um, and countries are also actively participating in twinning frameworks, and those twinning frameworks are really important. A twinning framework is, is, a, is a framework where one country is providing assistance to another country to, um, to meet some of the goals around um, prevention of AR. Um, and then again, the impact, is, of course, is to reduce AR um, and to uh, prevent the emergence of, of AR through strengthening surveillance and um, and um, uh, regulation of appropriate antibiotics, um, both in the human and the animal side. So specifically, what is CDC doing? Um, you know, I think when we started off the the um, the, t the 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 talk, I, um, Abigail had this nice introduction, but many of you might have been wondering, like, what is this International Infection Control Program? Because it's something that maybe probably a lot of you haven't heard about. Well, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes talking about what this is because it's a new program that also was born out of Ebola. And it's something I think that um, something to be aware of because this is one of the key areas that CDC is helping to provide this type of technical assistance. Um, this International Infection Con Control Program is, is built on the, on the decades of experience of, of, of DHQP, the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion, that provides the um, key domestic and international support for um, improving healthcare quality. And our purpose and our mission is to protect patients and healthcare workers globally by providing expertise, evidence, and implementation strategies to sustainably address infectious disease threats related to healthcare delivery. Um, and we have three different, three main areas where we concentrate: providing rapid assistance for outbreaks and other adverse events related to healthcare delivery, um, improving infection prevention control capacity um, to prevent and control HAIs and device-associated. Uh, HAI outbreaks, um, healthcare associated outbreaks and device associated HAI infections, and reduce the global burden of AMR, AMR associated with healthcare delivery. So these are the key areas where we're going to be working, and in a lot of the countries that we talked about that are, have low and middle um, incomes and, and are resource limited, we're going to have, be providing some of this in, a, in that twinning framework that I talked about to be able to, um, to be able to address infection control, to be able to provide um, a safer um, security environment for the United States and for um, countries um, internationally. So just in summary, to wrap up, um, I talked about how infection control is a critical component for outbreak response. Um, I talked about how infection control, IPC, and public health um, must be linked, and it must, that link must be strengthened um, 
I've also talked about how we can focus not only on the national systems but on subnational systems, so like facilities, and how facilities can focus on um, building that outbreak and infection control capacity for the long term. And I've talked about a little bit how some global, current global initiatives through this global health security and through other efforts can help, um, and how there is um, some effort in this space to try to build off of the lessons learned from a lot of these recent um, outbreaks and how um, we might together be able to work towards some of the solutions. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions if they come in. So this is Abigail Tumpy, and first, before we go to questions, we're going to try to get Linda Green from APIC um, back on the line, so please hold with us for one second while we try to transfer her in. This is Abigail Tempe from CDC, and hopefully we have Linda Green back with us. Linda, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you so much, Abigail. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, my name's Linda Green, and I'm president-elect of APEC, the Association of, for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. And I'm pleased that everyone joined today to participate in this webinar focusing on infection prevention and control in international settings. Because this webinar took place during International Infection Prevention Week, I would like to provide some background about I, in International Infection Prevention Week. International Pre Infection Prevention Week takes place the third week of October each year and raises awareness of the role infection prevention plays to improve patient safety. Since International Infection Prevention Week was established in 1986 by President Ronald Reagan, APIC has spearheaded the annual effort to highlight the importance of infection prevention among healthcare professionals, administrators, legislators, and consumers. And over the years, this week of recognition has vastly expanded to every corner of the globe including Australia, the United Kingdom, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. So as the reach of Infection Prevention Week widens, more patients benefit from safer healthcare practices and reduced threat of healthcare infections. And I think Dr. Park's presentation really summed this up. So the theme of this year's observance is break the chain of infection. APIC has created tools to help healthcare professionals advocate and promote infection prevention, give it infection prevention special visibility, and facilitate conversations about why infection prevention matters, from sample social media posts to infographics to podcasts to interactive quizzes. APIC has provided materials on how both healthcare professionals and consumers can help break the chain of infection. So visit APIC.org, Infection Prevention and You, to access these materials and sign our Infection Prevention Pledge. Together, we can break the chain of infection. Thank you for your commitment to infection prevention. We're honored that CDC again partnered with us on this International Infection Prevention Week, and we thank you all for listening today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda, and thanks for holding on um, so that we could get you back um, on the line. Um, we're going to go to our, our questions and answers, and hopefully both um, Linda and Ben will be able to um, we'll get through as many questions as we can. Our first question, Ben, is what steps are being taken to ensure that low- and middle-resource countries um, are better prepared to recognize and control the emergence of antibiotic-resistant infections? 
Thanks, Abigail. That um, is, a, is a great question, and it's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about and working on in our program and across CDC in general. Um, you know, I think we are just starting to see how important AR is at, on the domestic side. And I think a lot of us who work in healthcare facilities um, think about this every day, especially from an infection prevention standpoint. And there's a, to be honest with you, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the international setting because, you know, I think that our perspective in the United States, you know, we, we look at how equipped we are um, to handle these problems. And I just want you to think about a healthcare facility right now. So let's let's go to um, you know a country in a, in a lower middle income country um, where number one, your your ward you don't have single patient rooms. Your ward is an open ward. So um, what that means is there's a big room with um, let's say 20 beds, um, and there's one nurse's station at the end of the at the end of the room. It's a long room, and there are curtains between each room. It will, well, sometimes there are no curtains, but a lot of times there are. Um, and the beds um, <clears throat> they're meant to, they're meant to hold 20 they're meant to hold 20 beds, but it actually in this ward there are 30 beds because of overcrowding. They need to kind of squeeze more beds in there. Some of those beds are on the floor because there aren't enough gurneys, so they have either a mattress directly on the floor or there's um, a blanket that, they're, that a patient is sitting on on the floor. Sometimes there are two people on a bed because they need to fit more people, and um, and both patients patients are kind of occupying the same bed. Um, there's one hand hygiene station that's at the nurses station at the end of the at the end of the room. Um, there's one um, bathroom facility which may or may not be working, um, and. When you look at this type of situation, oh, and then there's also the the the, the laboratory can do things like a, a hematology profile, it can do a chemistry, but there's no microbiology, and there's no serology, um, and there's very limited ability to be able to kind of diagnose the, the exact microorganism. Um, so that's unfortunately the reality in a lot of um, low-income and middle-income um, countries where. Um, and of course, that's a generalization, but I just wanted to paint a picture for you. So you think about AR and you think about how, the other thing to mention is that, you know, a lot, because there is no microbiology, clinicians will, will typically treat empirically with um, antibiotics and typically they're going to be broad spectrum antibiotics because um, they don't know what they're treating. So they have to use something that's, that has a broad spectrum. Um, so when you're faced with that, it's really kind of a perfect storm of developing antimicrobial resistance and then spreading it around the facility. Uh, and so the solutions to that are complicated, um, but it's certainly something that we're focusing a lot of our energies on right now. So it's not just the CDC, WHO, other partners are working towards this. Um, and hopefully, um, hopefully we'll be able to make um, some progress in this area, but um, some of the key challenges that we, that we face are around Number one, just having a laboratory that can be a, that can help clinicians identify what these organisms are, um, so that they can um, appropriately treat um, patients with the correct antibiotics, and practicing basic infection control and preventing things like patients sharing the same bed, or um, you know patients um, being on the floor. Um, these are some kind of common sense things that we can, you know, any of us who are trained in infection control can look go into a into a facility and, and just see a million things that are wrong. Um, but it's, it's not pointing out all the things that are wrong, it's starting out, it's trying to identify where we can make some gains and where we can make some, some things right and how that will impact the overall situation. Thanks, Ben. Our next question is, now that Ebola has decreased, funds for basic PPE, such as gloves, are now extremely limited in low-income countries. What is being done or can be done can be done to assist in this area? Yeah, and this is another area that we talk about a lot. And um, certainly during the Ebola outbreak, there was um, part of the problem was that there wasn't enough PPE. And um, but that wasn't the entire problem. The other parts of the problem were that not only was there not enough PPE, people didn't know how to use PPE. So I would go into you know when I went to West Africa, we saw things like. Um, people would wear gloves and would, would wear gloves all day. You know, they would wear the same set of gloves all day because they didn't understand, they did, there was a lack of understanding around how gloves protected you from getting, um, from, from getting and transmitting disease. 
Um, you know, things like uh, gowns would be worn all day. And so, um, and so, not so. Yes, part of the issue was the lack of PPE, but part of the issue was also a lack of understanding. Um, and the core principles around, um, you know, around risk assessment and around um, around uh, transmission dynamics and breaking the chain of infection. Um, are things that we're emphasizing heavily right now in West Africa, because um, hopefully there will continue to be um, good stocks of PPE. But what's probably more important than just having PPE is the knowledge on how to use it correctly, and also the knowledge on how to protect yourself. If um, because I think we all understand that there are things that you can do even without the best PPE um, when you don't have it, because it is a reality in low and middle income countries where PPE. At times, you could have stockouts and you could have short supply. So we also not only have to provide the PPE, um, which is important for donor countries to understand, but we also have to teach them how to use it and how to how to best prepare themselves in case it doesn't, in case it's not there, because there there are things that people can do. So we've received several questions with regards to antibiotics being available over the counter in many other countries. Are there any efforts underway to stop OTC sales of antibiotics? in partner countries, and how does this play with regards to antibiotic resistance issues? These are great questions, um, and it shows that people really have a good understanding about what's going on. I think, you know, um, you don't even have to have worked in another country. You just have to have to, have to travel to another country to realize that you can get a lot of different things over the counter. And um, not, it's not, and when I say over the counter, what that really means is going to a, a pharmacist or what they call a chemist in certain areas of the world, and you can just really just ask for anything. And and in some countries there is regulation where they will limit what you can buy. There are some classes of, of antimicrobials that you're not able to purchase without a prescription. Sometimes you're not able to purchase any um, without a prescription. And this whole idea is kind of foreign to us, right? We're so used to not being able to buy anything over the counter that the very idea that you can buy some things over the counter or or possibly buy anything over the counter is just kind of crazy. But one thing to think about is that um, healthcare resources in low in and especially low income countries and to some degree middle income countries, um, healthcare dollars are, you know, the proportion of the GDP are small. So what that means is that there aren't that many doctors, there aren't that many nurses, there aren't that many, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, health healthcare, there isn't much healthcare access. And this becomes a problem especially where there isn't healthcare access because we have to remember that while AR is, is a problem, you know, dying from diarrhea and dying from pneumonia is also a huge problem. And, and if you limit the number of acts, if you limit the access to antimicrobials um, across the board, then people will die from pneumonia. People will die from diarrhea. And that is also, a, um, would be a terrible consequence. So uh, we have to be, uh, we have to understand these things. We have to understand the realities around, um, around um, access, what we call access to antimicrobials versus excess of antimicrobials, where certainly there are, there is an overuse of antimicrobials, but how can we better, how can we, how can we balance this, this problem? Because it's unfortunately, it's, 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 it's not as easy as saying that every antimicrobial needs a prescription because there are, I think, untoward effects that could happen, um, and it's actually more complicated than that. So we have received several other questions that we're not going to get to today. Um, we've also received questions about where to contact CDC in case you do have follow-up questions in the future. The best email box to use is patientsafety at cdc.gov. That's patientsafety at cdc.gov. And before I remind our participants about continuing education opportunities, Linda, did you have any um, additional final comments from the APIC perspective that you would like to convey? Uh, no. Um, actually, I think Dr. Parks has done a great job. I, I just want to reinforce uh, that certainly APIC does have an international presence and also all of the tools that are available because I think they're so very important. So thank you so much. So to receive continuing education, you must complete and pass a post-test activity at 80% and also complete a webinar evaluation. When you close out of the webinar, a post-meeting webpage will appear that will have detailed instructions about completing continuing education. The access code for the webinar is W. C as in cat, 1018. So if you go to 
www.cdc.gov slash T-C-E online and use the access code WC1018. You'll be able to access continuing education for this particular um, webinar. Additionally, a follow-up email will be sent out this afternoon with detailed instructions and also um, with the slides as promised. We'd like to thank our speakers today and we also would like to thank APIC for your tremendous partnership in having this particular webinar available on International Infection Prevention Week. Thank you all for joining us today and thank you for your commitment to keeping patients safe.